Revenge Story Part 1 From the rape victims who castrated their rapist in court to the U.S. soldiers who summarily executed the Nazi concentration camp guards at Dachau, these are some of history's greatest revenge stories. Revenge is a dish best served cold and these true revenge stories are frigid. Now what happened? Nothing is more dramatic than revenge stories and histories full of such tales. There is the story of Diana the bus driver Hunter, who took matters into her own hands in response to the growing number of femicides in Mexico that went uninvestigated. There was also the mass execution of Nazi prison guards at Dachau concentration camp by American soldiers who liberated the camp in 1945, or the gruesome fate of Aku Yadav, who raped 200 women and was later beaten, stomped, and stabbed to death by a mob of his victims. Revenge Part 2 Buford Pusser, the cop who took out mobsters to avenge his wife. The mobsters who killed Pusser's wife were mysteriously killed off one by one. The first on our list of revenge stories involves a sheriff turned vigilante after his wife was killed in a shooting by southern mobsters. His name was Buford Pusser and his righteous journey to avenge his wife was later adapted numerous times, including the movie Walking Tall, featuring Wayne The Rock Johnson. For most of his life, Pusser made his career in public service. Before he was a police officer, Pusser served as a Marine who later enjoyed a brief stint as a popular wrestler in Chicago. His tall frame and large build earned him the nickname Buford the Bull in the Ring. In Chicago, he met his future wife, Pauline, and they got married two years later. The couple moved to Pusser's hometown in McNary County, Tennessee, where Pusser quickly rose through the ranks of local law enforcement. He was elected chief of police and constable, and later he was elected county sheriff at just 27 years old, making him the youngest sheriff ever elected in Tennessee history. The young sheriff was fearless and wasted no time cracking down on mafia activity, concentrating on the state border between Tennessee and Mississippi, which was controlled by two separate gangs, the Dixie Mafia and the State Line Mob. The mob gangs made a lot of money off their illegal production of moonshine, so Pusser's crackdown was obviously not appreciated. By 1967, Pusser had survived countless assassination attempts, killing several of the hitmen who tried to take him out. He was a local hero to the public, but he became a prime target for the increasingly desperate mob. Dwayne Johnson in Walking Tall, 2004 which was loosely based on Buford Pusser's story. Things changed forever on August 12, 1967, when his wife, Pauline, decided on a whim to accompany him to investigate a roadside disturbance. A car pulled up alongside theirs and suddenly opened fire. Pusser suffered a severe injury to his jaw but survived. His wife, however, was killed. Stricken with the guilt over his wife's death at the hands of a mob hit, Pusser was most likely the only intended target. Pusser cracked down on crime even harder than before. He publicly named his four assassins and Kirksey McCord Nix Jr., the leader of the Dixie Mafia, as the mastermind behind the hit that killed his wife. Although Nix never saw justice for Pauline Pusser's murder, though he was later sentenced to life in prison for ordering the murder of a Mississippi Circuit Court judge, the other assassins involved in the murder of Pusser's wife mysteriously dropped dead one by one. Rumors circulated that Pusser had organized hits on the Mafia members to avenge his wife. But because there was no evidence to tie him to the deaths personally, and possibly because nobody was going to prosecute Pusser for avenging his murdered wife, Pusser was never charged for the killings. Revenge Part 3 Mary I. Octavia I, who plowed through Nazis with a tank to avenge her husband. After her husband was killed by Nazis, Maria Octavia I bought a tank to avenge him. During the Second World War, an estimated 800,000 Russian women served in the Red Army and Maria Octavia was one of them. 
but more than a patriotic calling, Octavia Bruskaya's military service was the consequence of her husband's death at the hands of Nazis. Mary Octavia Bruskaya came from a Crimean peasant family, had a deep sense of loyalty to the USSR, and was a firm believer in communism. Her sense of duty arguably deepened after she married an army officer named Dalia Okiabruskaya. Marry a serviceman, and you serve in the army calm as she once declared. When her husband was killed fighting against the Nazis in Kiev, instead of giving in to her grief, Okiabruskaya found another way to cope, revenge. She sold all her belongings and bought a T-34 tank which she christened Fighting Girlfriend so she could kill the Nazi invaders. In order for her to make sure that she would be the one behind the wheel of the tank, Actia Bruskaya reportedly made her case to Joseph Stalin himself. In a letter to the Russian leader, Actia Bruskaya wrote, My husband was killed in action defending the motherland. I want revenge on the fascist dogs for his death and for the death of Soviet people tortured by the fascist barbarians. Actia Bruskaya died while fighting in the Leningrad Novgorod offensive. Stalin, no doubt aware of the propaganda value of such a request, approved her plan and Actia Bruskaya underwent five months of training. Despite the support from Russia's leader, Mary Octavia Bruskaya was still vastly outnumbered by her male compatriots who likely put little faith in her abilities. It didn't take long for her to prove herself, however. In her first tank battle in October 1943, Fighting Girlfriend was the first tank to breach enemy lines and Octavia Bruskaya proceeded to wreak absolute havoc against German troops, crushing many under the treads of her T-34. A month later, she fearlessly jumped out of her tank to make needed repairs under heavy fire from the enemy, popped back in, and got back into the fight. To Mary Octavia Bruskaya, the horrors of war only strengthened her resolve. I've had my baptism by fire. I beat the bastards. Sometimes I am so angry I can't even breathe calm as she wrote in an emotional letter to her sister. Mary Octavia Bruskaya died fighting the Nazis a few months later in January 1944 during the Red Army Aslan and Novgorod Offensive.